What's up, Vox and Hops heads? How you all doing? This is it, episode number 35. I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for listening to last week's episode. Uh, my episode, Vox and Hops number 34, with Travis Ryan, was uh, actually the most downloaded Vox and Hops episode ever. So uh, I just want to thank all of you people who listened, uh, people who shared it, uh, people who told their friends they should listen to it. I really, really fucking appreciate that. Uh, Vox and Hops is growing, and it's thanks to all of you. I'm home for a while now. I got back from Europe, as I mentioned in the last episode. My next tour is in July. The Laws of the Flesh 2019, the first Cryptopsy Asian tour, starts on July 5th in Singapore, and it runs all the way to July 14th. Uh, I'm going to be hitting Singapore, Bangkok, Indonesia, Vietnam, Taiwan, Osaka, Japan, Tokyo, Japan, and Seoul, Korea. I can't wait to get there. I'm going to include all of the ticket links in the description. You guys should check it out if you're from over there. Come out and party with Cryptos. It's going to be so much fun. With all that being said, thank you so much for listening. This is Vox and Hops, episode number 35. I recorded this episode in Houston. Check it out. Here it is, my episode with Mike Caputo from Rings of Saturn. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. What's up, everybody? Today we are in Houston, and I am with Mike Caputo, the drummer of Rings of Saturn. That's me. How What's up, doing? brother? How you doing? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, let everyone know who Mike Caputo is. Drummer for Rings of Saturn, like you said. Uh, also play for a local band here called Desecrate the Faith, Brutal Death Metal. Um, don't tour a whole lot with that band, but when we do, you know, we tour with decent underground bands. Our last tour was with uh, Putridity a couple of years ago. That was cool, mainly the Fest circuit. Um, and then I do session work when people want me. That's actually how I got the Rings gig, was uh, session stuff. So um, that's really all I got going on in my life right now. My, my earliest memory of you is uh, us playing in Houston, Devastation on the Nation, and there's this drummer that's already set up on the floor, <laughs> blasting, and we're like, who is this kid? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, throughout the years, <laughs> we have this, like, toy name for you in our band. Oh, great. Because there's this local ce celebrity up in Quebec called the Jérémy. Okay. And he's this, like, little dude, and yeah. we call you the tall Jeremy, Le Grand Jérémy. Okay. And then when I, we saw you got the, the rings gig, we're yeah. like, ah! Le Grand Jeremy, he's got a real gig now. <laughs> no, no just disrespect to yeah. Desecrate, but like a, a touring gig. Yeah. So, so uh, That's better than what most people usually, I get from most people. I, I, usually people are like, oh, you look like the kid from The Little Giants. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm like, that's cool. I've never seen that movie, but I get the reference. That's like, too funny. It's the, I need to get like a, a bowl cut now, I guess. <laughs> so. uh, you brought me some beer. I did. It's the St. Arnold. Yes, lawnmower. Fancy lawnmower. Yes. A German style Colt. Let's see what this sucker's got. Cheers. Cheers. It's smooth. Yeah. It's nice. It's a perfect Texan weather. Yes. Drinking afternoon beer. Local Houston brew right here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, tell me about growing up in, you grew up in Houston? I grew up in, uh, on Long Island and then. Really? Yeah. Okay. And then when I was 15, right before I turned 16, we moved to Houston. Okay. So, uh. Was signed for my house that I live in currently, and on my 16th birthday, and uh, finished out high school here. Um, well, actually, we'll we'll go back like uh, two years before that. I was playing in a in a pop punk band actually. No, you weren't. When I lived on Long Island, yeah, I was playing like Blink 182 ripoff music, basically. Really? Um, that's how I started actually playing faster stuff. Was you know pop punk because I was building up. My whole right side of my body, my left <laughs> side was kind of lagging behind because it's just two and four, you know? But, yeah, yeah, got it, yeah. Um, and then quit the band to move to Houston because my parents were like, hey, we're moving. I'm like, all right, cool. So that was, uh, you know, then I moved here, uh, filled in for a couple friends in high school for they had a blues rock band. So I would play like Hendrix and Cream and stuff like that. But when I was home, I would play like Dream Theater and things oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, started Desecrate in 2012. Do you remember your first early drum influences? What made you want to start playing drums? So I got my first drum kit when I was five, five or six. Really? Right. Yeah. And then, but it was like a vintage Ludwig kit, Red Sparkle. I can't remember what model it was. Um, and I just destroyed that thing. Like I was, <laughs> I was a five or six year old kid. I was just like, what? Didn't take it seriously. And then um, 
didn't touch drums for another seven years, right? And then uh, my parents got me like a desktop, like Yamaha DD50 piece of crap, like electric kit, right? And I was there's songs built in to that uh, to that kit with drums, and you could take the song away and listen to just the drums, and then you could also listen to different parts of the drums and take them away from that. So I was kind of putting together in my brain, like, oh, all these sounds, okay, that's this pad here, and then this other sound is this pad here, so if I just kind of coordinate it, right? So I started playing to these tracks when I was like 12, and my parents thought I was just listening to them in my room, <laughs> and they were walking by, and they were like, oh, he's playing those, okay, we need to get him lessons. So I started taking lessons at 12, and um, then I got took lessons for six months. I got my first drum kit, and then it's been just rolling since, since, then. since then. Yeah, and then playing the uh, Dream Theater was a huge influence. Like the DVD that came with my drum kit had Mike Portnoy on it, so I was like just playing Mike Portnoy rip off fills all the time. Like you know the little Portnoyisms he does. So how do you feel about his uh, Hello Kitty videos? They're very entertaining. Uh, it's a cool, you know, cool little concept to get a lot of views and attention on, you know. And he's a good drummer, you know, that's the thing. He's a very good drummer, yeah. yeah. One of the best, yeah. I'm kind of bummed he's not in Dream Theater anymore. So am I, so am I, but that new album is good. I've, I, that's yeah. what I've heard. Yeah, I haven't the new gotten, album is actually good. I haven't yeah. gotten to listen to it yet. Way better than that concept one before. That's what I heard. I've heard very bad things <laughs> Really did not that like that first that one there. I've heard people like... It's too really, long. Yeah, I've a. heard it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a double album. Double album, it's like... Two and a half hours long. Or like they did, they did the double album for Six Degrees, and like that was awesome because it like, was quality, yeah. right? And yeah. the whole second, the whole second record was the the whole second album was the Six Degrees mm -hmm. album, and so it was uh, that was good. But like the whole concept thing, yeah, people were like panning that like universally. <laughs> I just didn't get it. So let's talk about beer. Are you a craft beer enthusiast? Not necessarily. Um, I generally don't have a lot of money to drink like <laughs> like higher quality beers um i do appreciate a good tasting beer though like okay. that's the thing I, I wouldn't go out of my way to drink like you know craft beers um mainly i stick with you know this is gonna sound blasphemous i stick with like budweiser and stuff like that but like if i'm feeling fancy i'll have like a shiner or something or a blue moon or like a, a lawnmower mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um yeah, mainly I just, you know, I pay, I go to the gas station, I, I spend four bucks and I get 25 ounce of Budweiser, you know? <laughs> Do you remember your first experience with beer? Yes, actually. Um, it, aside from like just my dad going, here, try this, you know, just have a sip or whatever. Um, I was at band practice uh, for Desecrate in 2012 and my guitar player at the time was talking about like he, we practiced behind a gas station in a storage unit, and he was, he was saying something about he wanted to get beer, but he wouldn't, he didn't want to, you know, pay for it or whatever because he'd be the only one that drank it. And um, he knew I didn't really drink beer at the time, and I was like, if you get a six pack of Shiner, I will drink it with you. And he was like, elated. He was so <laughs> happy. So he went to the gas station and he got a six pack of it, and you know, we drank a couple beers, and that that was it. And then. From then on, I didn't really like. I'm not like a heavy drinker, but um, you know, I'll drink socially out and about. You know. Do you have a favorite craft beer if you had to pick one? If you did have the money and you could afford to go out there. Not uh, not at the top of my head. I mean, like mainly just I like St. Arnold stuff because it's it's local, so that's most of what I'm exposed to. I, I like the 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 artwork on this. Yeah, and uh, funny uh, funny story about the 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 lawnmower. So. Uh, apparently, according to some people, it's just called lawnmower, but it has fancy above the lawnmower. That's right. Yeah. Right. So my bass player for Desecrate calls it fancy lawnmower, right? <laughs> so he, we played a show in Austin at the Dirty Dog. I don't know if you've been there. That's a cool, the name sounds familiar, but it's on Sixth Street. It's like got that weird stage. It's just in, shoved in the corner, right? Okay. okay. And um, they have lawnmower on tap. And um, my bass player goes up and he's like, yeah, let me get some fancy lawnmower. <laughs> and the bartender's like, you mean lawnmower? And he's like, no, lawnmower. He's like arguing with this bartender. It does like, say fancy lawnmower. It says lawnmower. fancy on the label, right. And he pointed to the handle on the, on the tap and was like, see, that's says fancy right there, fancy lawnmower. And um, <laughs> the bartender just gave up and served him his beer. But uh, we can never... Uh, 
decide whether it is fancy lawnmower. I think it's supposed to be fancy lawnmower. I think just, so from too. Just, from just looking at the label. Yeah, uh-huh. I think so too. But other people will disagree with you. Definitely good. Uh, you can definitely mow your lawn while drinking a lawnmower. That's for sure. It is. It's actually now that you say that, thinking about drinking one of these after a nice, you know, lawn mowing. I have a friend. Shout out to Derek. I'm going to tell your story right now. Derek, Derek and I started drinking beer together back in the day, and he recently got like a. A little house that has a, a yard in the back. Mm-hmm. And he plays this game where he leaves his beer on the table near his house and he does the circle, <laughs> mowing a circle. And every time he passes, he takes a sip of beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Shout out to Derek, yeah. Fellow drummer. Yeah, yeah. I can't uh, can't do that when I mow my lawn. So I have a push mower. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I have a push mower and the table on my porch is too far away. <laughs> Ingenuity, engineering, you could figure it out, fix the problem. Well, we're, we're moving to a different house uh, there you soon, go. so maybe we can figure it out. I'll, I'll give it a shot at my new place. Let, let's uh, talk about you joining Rings. What was that day like for you? You get the call, you get the email. So it was really, it was weird. So um, I actually, so they asked uh, a friend of mine, um, Marco, Lord Marco, to, to uh, record the album, right? The new Rings album. And they were like, hey, do you know anyone for touring? And he recommended me, but he didn't tell me. He was just kind of feeling me out. Like the day before, he was like, you know, without naming any names, he was like, oh, would you do, would you want to like do a a tour with, you know, you know, in a van for, you know, X weeks, you know, that kind of thing. And I was like, dude, if you're thinking out loud to me about you doing that, I'll do it. Like, I took it upon myself to be like, if you don't do that, I'll do it. And But he didn't tell me who it was. And I woke up the next morning at, like, 10.30 to a, a message from Marco going, hey, it's Rings of Saturn. Uh, Lucas is going to message you in 30 minutes. I'm like, w- okay, uh, I guess... Uh I guess I'm touring with Rings of Saturn now. Were were you a fan of the band? Yes. um, I was, so, I kind of didn't really listen to Embryonic Anomaly, the first record, when it came out. Um, I was mainly, um, that was, what, 2009 when that came out? Um, I was mainly listening to, like, um, less technical stuff, I guess. I was listening to, like, the Doom EP from Job for Cowboy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. more like, you know... I don't want to call it caveman, but like there's less the shreddy stuff, yeah. Um, and then they, uh, Dinjir came out that second record, and I downloaded it because the band put it up for download. I guess it got leaked, mm-hmm. um, and like a pre-production version got leaked, and the band was like, "If you guys are going to download this record and listen to it, listen to the the real record." So they released the record for free before it came out. So I downloaded it, and I was like, okay, I've heard a lot of things about this band. I'll jam it. And it blew my mind. I was like, this is insane. And uh, so I listened to that. I listened to the next record, Le Galkien. And, like, it's all, like, crazy. And I didn't think it was humanly possible to play that stuff until I saw them on Summer Slaughter. And, uh, yeah, it just blew my mind, man. Did you think that you would ever be there? Oh, no. Like, even I was sitting sitting in um, Lucas's house... Like, I, I posted like a Facebook status. Like, I cannot believe I, if you. I went back to 2013 and found myself at Summer Slaughter watching that band on stage. If they told, if I told my past self that I would be playing for them, there's no way. Cause like, I would never think I could play that like that. I would never think I would be in a band, not just that band, but any band that was doing, you know, successful like things like that. And now I'm doing it, and it's like, it's super cool, man. <laughs> like, well, what steps did you have to take to bring yourself from 2013 watching to actually playing it, like improving your skills? So a lot of that is with Desecrate Music. Um, I, the first two records, we're uh, in the process of finishing up a third record right now, but the first two records... I wrote about half of those records, like half of each of those records. You play guitar, too? I don't play guitar, but I know my way around a guitar. Okay. Like, I can figure things out. Um, and then we tab everything out in a program called Tabit. It's like a simplified version of Guitar Pro, basically. And um, so I wrote stuff. First of all, my guitar players hated me because I wrote ridiculous guitar <laughs> parts that weren't, like, natural to play, like, position-wise. Yeah, of course, But yeah. I was like, it sounds cool. Play Let's it. do it. Yeah, we're going to play it. Uh, but while doing that, I wrote 
harder and harder drum parts. Yeah, to, to compensate. Right. And it was like the way I would get better is I would write at the top of my ability level. And like, so we'd, every time we'd learn a new song, we'd have to take a break for 10 minutes because we like, all of us would just be dying after the song, we'd finish playing. And then eventually we would, you know, get to the point where we could play it a couple times in a row. We'd play it in the middle of the set list. We'd open with it, you know, mm -hmm, things like mm -hmm. that. So that was kind of, and it would just happen continuously over the years. Um, and then also a major thing that helped with rings because I use a lot of double strokes on my feet um, with rings was, uh, again, Lord Marco, he asked me to fill in for him for this uh, band from Canada called Abuse. And I don't know them. They're, they're Sh awesome. Shout out to a fellow Canadian. Yes. They, uh, he asked me in, I think it was like late December a couple years ago, like, hey, there's this band Abuse like um, that I play for, and I can't do this one show. They're playing Las Vegas Death Fest in June. It's six months away. You'll have plenty of time to prepare. Here's a song, you know, and I didn't trust him because it's Marco. I was like, this stuff is going to be ridiculous if you're playing it. And he sent me a song from uh, the new Abuse record that he played on, and he sent me an easy song, and he was like, this is as hard as it gets. And I was like, okay. And... Uh, I was, so I told him I would do it, and then they sent me the rest of the album, and I was like, this shit is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. And Just, uh, like, speed-wise? or just, Yeah. Um, like, okay. it's topping out at, like, 300. And That's where the double strokes came in. Yeah, I didn't know how to do them. That's the thing. So I was like, I can either, and I'm very... For the people at home that don't know what double strokes are, I know what they are, you know what they are, but yes. if you could describe it to people. So, essentially, on if, hands and feet, you can do the same thing. It's a, People think it's a little more difficult on your feet, but it's where you play two strokes per side. So, you play, like, right, right, left, left, right, okay. right, left, With left. With, like, a heel, toe? Yeah, uh, people call it, like, heel, toe, but the motion is, like, it's more like you're dropping your whole leg and then rolling your foot forward. It's not so much slamming your heel down and then it's just, it looks like you're dropping your heel and then going forward. But, but the coordination of it takes time. And yeah, it's it's one of those things where once it clicks, then you ex excel really quickly. So it took me about three months to learn how to do it, like to get it to where it was like playable. And then another three months to go over the material and get it like really tight because I'm the kind of person where I'm very particular I don't want to like half ass what I'm learning you know I don't if because I only knew how to do single strokes at the time so I thought I could either do triplets instead of you know six you know eighth note triplets instead of 16 notes yeah, yeah, yeah. but it would just wouldn't sound as aggressive because abuse is a death grind band and it's got to be in your face and crazy all the time and so I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this technique. So I learned it, and so I could play the stuff just like on the record. And now you can do it with rings. Now, and that's the thing. is like I kept, I wanted to not do them anymore after, um, after the abuse gig, but I kept getting calls for gigs that I, my singles couldn't keep up with. Mm -hmm. So I just had to keep them, and now I just keep them. I just keep them around. So or let's talk about Lucas. Okay. I would have loved to have interviewed Lucas because mm -hmm. I have lots of questions for him. Uh, what is it like working for Lucas Mann? It's, I say working cuz I feel like Yeah, I mean it's I mean I am technically like a session guy for them, yeah. so I am technically working for yeah. the band. Um it's cool, man. He's he's very um contrary to what people say about him. Um I have you know, had no no problems. He's super understanding. Um, he's he answers any questions I may have. He keeps me up to date on everything. Um, yeah, I don't have anything bad to say about him. So what what about the the day that he put out that Facebook post or Instagram, Twitter, whatever? Yeah, I am I am the best technical death metal writer of the modern era. Prove me wrong. <laughs> and I'm still young as fuck. And I'm fuck. still young as fuck. So what the, what, let's He's, How did so, you feel on that day? I was I knew that was going to be <laughs> a thing um as far as like when he posts, I saw him post it and he has a tendency to kind of be kind of trolly. So I saw that coming from a million miles away where he was the internet was going to explode. And I was just like, 
I'm just gonna put my phone down and I'm not gonna say anything. Just I'm gonna just watch and see what happens. And sure enough, it just exploded into this thing. And um, yeah, it's. I mean, he was just trying to get a rise out of people, and he he did. And that's kind of, you know, he's one of those people that's like, you know, no publicity is bad publicity. He wants people talking about him and the band, and they're doing it. So that was like kind of his thing. It definitely, it definitely worked yeah, <laughs> because it's... everyone was talking about him. How, how organized was it? Because the next day he had shirts up for sale. Oh man, he. Do you think he organized this, or is it just he hit a he... nerve and then he jumped on it? I think he just kind of did it, uh, like he was just trying to do it as, uh, like I said, kind of as a joke, and um, it just got out of hand. Um, <laughs> and so he's he's a businessman. Like at the end of the day, he's very business oriented. So he saw people's extreme reaction to that, and he was like, I can sell shirts and make some money from this. So he he sold shirt. People bought shirts of him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, it's say you can say whatever you want about him. Like, the dude knows how to, like, run a business. Like, he's really good at it. Be- being in a band with a man that runs a band, writes all the music, but then doesn't tour it, how do you feel about that? It's... For me, I'm just happy to be touring. Like, yeah. I'm not even... It doesn't really bother me too much. Like, I was a fan of the band before... And you were he, never, like, disappointed when you went to a show and Lucas wasn't there? No. I mean, I, I like the music. You know, okay. I'm there... F- I mean, I love seeing it played live. I don't care who's playing it, really, as long as it's played well. He's like the Hans Zimmer of death metal. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just... I'm ready for him to come back, you know? He's... I'm, I'm excited for when he does. Um... But it's it'd be cool to see him play again, you know. Do, do you agree with his statement? Which do you oh, think he's, he... he's okay? So he would want me to qualify <laughs> that he said he was one of oh, okay. the best yeah. of the modern era. He never said he was the best. He said he is one of, and I will give it to him. I mean, you could see it in the success of the band. And there's got to be something there, you know. He's, you know. But people love the music, you know. I mean, it's mainly like a younger audience, but like that's mainly what kids want to hear now. Like I think John Longstreth said it best, where he said, "Kids want to hear machine guns; they don't want to hear death metal." You know, mm-hmm. so they want to hear people play at the top of their game, writing the most ridiculous shit, but it's still got to make sense, you know. Song wise, yeah. Song wise, yeah. it can't just be. It's you know there's still riffs there under all of it. It's not it's, just masturbation. Yeah, as much as people want to make fun of the music or whatever, and like they haven't, I can tell when people haven't dug into the music as much as they should because there's definitely riffs there and there's some damn good riffs there. Absolutely. And people just focus on all the noodly, blah, 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 yeah. that, you know, <laughs> they focus on all that. If, if you had to make your list of the top. Tech Def guitar writers out there. Who would be on your list? Uh, Muhammad from Necrophagist. He's no brainer. Just that's number one. Um, just because of all the classical stuff, he sneaks all kinds of classical pieces in there. You don't really recognize or or realize it. Um, uh, who's the dude from um, Spawn of Possession? Um, I don't know. B- both of those guys Not bad. though. Um, super awesome guitar players and composers. Um, you know, Rings is up there, obviously. Um, who else? Malcolm from Inferi and A Loathing mm-hmm. Requiem, especially that one-man project, A Loathing Requiem, that he does. That's one of those... Uh, Acolytes Eternal is one of those few records where I can just listen to the entire thing. I don't skip a single track. Um, so those... What was that? Four? And then if I had to pick a fifth one... Man. I don't know if I could pick a fifth one as far as, like, tech death, but... There's there's a lot of good stuff out there. Who do you think is the best modern tech death drummer active today? Um, as far as technique? Something you can watch every night and just freak out. Oh, John Longstreth. Yeah? Oh, my God. That guy is a robot. Yeah. Um, Shout out to John. It's been a long time. I haven't yeah. seen you. His technique is second to none. Like, the dude hits hard at mm-hmm. those tempos, too. That's another thing. A lot of these guys can play really fast. But they're just like... You know, I mean, they're not tapping, but they're not hammering their kit. I remember I saw um, a Devastation on the Nation tour. Um, I can't remember what year it was. I want to say it was 2015 with um, Aeon and Origin. Dude, Emil and John back-to-back was insane. Emil is another one of those guys that just plays super hard. 
And he's using marching sticks when he plays too, which is uh, crazy to me. And um, that means that they're heavier. Yeah, they're huge. They're like tree trunks. (laughs) And um, you know, on top of him using giant sticks, he also just plays hard. His kicks, like he gets tons of throw on his beaters every time. Like I remember seeing a video of him recording a Blood Red Throne song, and it was all just camera audio. And he's hauling on these 16 note kicks, and you can hear it above like everything else, just from the camera. And the camera's above the kit, That's cool. like not yeah. by the not by the floor. And so that that turned me on to him, and I was like, this guy is an animal. What would be a dream tour for you? Everyone that hopes Necrophages makes a comeback, so I want a tour with Necrophages. That'd be insane. Me and Jason actually from Origin have a bet going <laughs> that. Uh, that Necrophagist is going to put something out this year. You think so? He thinks so. Oh. Because Muhammad's been showing up at shows around Germany. Really? Okay. So he's like... There's a funny story about Muhammad and Cryptopsy, actually. Way back in the day, um, Alex O'Byrne, shout out, been a long time, I haven't seen you either. Uh, he claims that back in the day, because fans sometimes show up and give us like their demos and stuff, yeah. he claims to have been given a, a cassette tape by Mohammed uh-huh. way back in the day with early necrophages stuff. Oh, like from like the 90s, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Where um it, that was like all the bonus tracks on the like the onset. I, I don't re- I don't know what it was, but I think it was like before it came out and stuff there, yeah. Yeah, that was Yeah, they did a um when he, they did the re-release of Onset of uh, Putrefaction, they did uh, two bonus tracks, and it was from the cassette. Maybe, maybe that's what yeah. uh, Alex was given. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so Necrophagist, uh, obviously, um, Spawn of Possession, if they make a comeback, um, even though they just broke up. Um, I love Cryptopsy, so I would love to tour at Cryptopsy. And then uh, either Origin or Nile. I can't, yes. I can't figure yes. out which one, but I would love to do that. And Suffocation, if we could fit another band on there. <laughs> Just because I love those dudes. Mm-hmm. They're great guys. And also, like, they're, like, Pierce from Within and Effigy the Forgotten. I'm actually wearing an Effigy shirt right now. Yes, he are is. Two of my most favorite records of all time. So just to be able to hear that stuff every day. It would be incredible. And traveling with those boys because there's yeah, so much fun. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They're, they're great dudes, you know. What do you got coming up? What's Rings doing? We actually just announced two tours. Um, we're doing three weeks in Europe uh, from May 3rd to the 26th, I think. Um, there's a flyer. You can find the flyer for it on the Rings page. And then um, also we just announced um, a few dates in Australia and New Zealand at the end of June or middle to end of June. Um, some great, great beer in New Zealand. I am very excited. I suggest you go drink some beer in New Zealand. Me and uh, one of my buddies from a band out there called Carnal were talking about uh, having some beers afterwards. He's uh, super excited to come to the show. So awesome, awesome. I'm very excited about that. That sounds fun. That sounds fun. And uh, at what point do you think you're going to become a permanent member of Rings, or are you just... I'm just waiting, taking it, waiting, and just taking it easy. I'm just taking it easy. I'm just taking it day by day. You know, like it's something you'd be interested in. Yeah, yeah. I would. I would love to, but it's, um, you know, it's not really my decision. It's just I'm just along for the ride, and if they offer it, cool. You know, um, if not, you know, hey, that's how the world works. You know, mm-hmm. but they they seem they're not asking anybody else to play drums for them. So I mean. I think I'm doing okay right now. So. You are doing okay. I, li- I like I like your your work ethic. Uh, as I said when I first met you, you were this guy. You were ready. You were like set up before any of us were set up, and you were like ready to go. You seem like a a hungry little professional. Yeah, and you're a good drummer. I'm trying to do it. One last story. Let's talk about the Attila bus story. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, the Attila bus story. All right. So. It was the first tour I did with Rings last year. It was a six week tour. Uh, we were like a mid we were like mid card, right? And um, the headliner was Attila, Suicide Silence was before them, Volumes, um, then us, then uh, Spite and uh, Cross Your Fingers. Those were that was the whole lineup for the tour. It was like a packed yeah, tour. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Um so all the Attila guys know that I don't like to take shots. Like, I just don't, I'm not, they taste bad, and I get really carried away. I have a low tolerance for them. Like, every time I've done shots, I just, I black out, and it's like, it's not good. So, um, it was Alex's, our tour manager. Uh, shout and out Sat to Kendrick. Alex Kendrick. <laughs> it was his birthday 
Ooh, but and bad so, news. Yeah, so he's going nuts on that. Like, he's like, yeah, party, woo! He's, and he's on the bus, like, to doing whatever with, with the Attila guys, right? I assume taking shots and whatever. So I'm standing by the van, and I'm an old man. I just want to go to sleep and leave, right? And I'm like, this dude is just partying. Like, I get it. It's his birthday, but he's been, like, people have been feeding him free drinks all night. Like, he's, he's had enough drinks, right? That's Kendrick. Yeah, so I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go get him. So I get, I knock on the bus. I go in, and I'm like, all right, Alex, let's go. So he's like, all right. He's all, you know, partied out or whatever. So we're, <laughs> we, he stumbles off the bus, and I'm behind him. And I, Brian, the drummer for Attila, comes up to us as we're leaving the bus. And he's like, hey, let's go on the bus and have a shot. And Alex is like, fuck yeah, let's have a shot, right? Because he, you know, he just came from having shots with, 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 you know, all the other guys. So he goes on the bus, and I told Brian, I said, I will have a beer with you. I don't do shots, but I'll have a beer, right? And he goes, okay, cool. That's awesome. So we go on the bus, and then the the mob pack mentality kicks in. There's a bunch of people on the bus, and he's trying to, like, force feed me shots. And I'm like, I told you I'll have a beer with you, right? I see Michelob in right the fridge. Right you, there. You open yeah. the fridge to get your bottle of liquor. I see it right there. I'll have a drink. And... He's like, no, you got to take a shot. And, like, him and, like, their stage manager are, like, chanting my name to take shots. I'm like, I'm not doing it. And uh, so he's like, I'm going to give you one more chance to take a shot with me. Otherwise, I'm kicking you off the bus. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. And he's like, all right. And he grabs me by the legs and picks me up from the back of the bus and carries me to the door and slams me down, like, on my feet. Like, puts plants me by the door and goes... Close the door on your way out, and then just kicks me <laughs> off the bus. And I'm like, what? I got thrown off of Attila's bus for for not drinking for not with taking them. a shot with them. I was like, all right, cool. Well, they they're known as like a party band, so I didn't want to party with them. So, <laughs> well, at least you stand by your morals. Yeah, that's yeah, you got your rules, and I like that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm the, that kind of dude. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sitting down with me, drinking a beer with me, having a chat with me. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. I know you're going to do lots of good things in your career. I'm sending you lots of positive vibes. Keep it up. Thank you. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for listening right to the end. Uh, Mike Caputo, cool kid, great, great fucking drummer. Uh, you guys should all keep your eyes out for him. He's uh, going to go far, and uh, I'm proud of the progress that he's made over the years. All the best to you, Mike. Thank you for being so cool, sitting down with me on Vox and Hops. As I mentioned, Cryptopsy's going to Asia. Get your tickets. It's in the description. Next week on the podcast, I have uh, the Rings of Saturn and Cryptopsy North American sound guy. I have Mr. Alexander Kendrick. Everybody get your tequila and sodas ready. You got to sit back and listen to what this kid's got to say. He's young. He's fun. He's full of energy, but he's an absolutely fucking great sound man. So check it all out. Vox and Hops episode number 36 with Alexander Kendrick. I appreciate all uh, the kind words I'm getting, the support. Keep sharing the podcast. There is no Vox and Hops without all you guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you. Hang out with your loved ones. Hang out with your friends. Hang out with your family. I'm going to be. I'm back from tour, and I'm really, really, really enjoying being home. I was out for quite a bit, and it's always nice to just uh, find your feet in your house, enjoying your shower, your toilet, all the good things that come with being home, and hang out with my family, of course. And, you know, drinking a whole bunch of great craft local Quebec beers. So I hope you have a great weekend. Cheers, Vox and Hopsets.